it really helps uh, with the training and the other things that we got coming in the future. Also, I want to, uh, so I know we, I, asked, I, I posed some questions and some people answered those questions, some people didn't, but we will be covering uh, those here around in the middle of the class, wherever it pops up at. We talked about, is it a foul to remove your helmet off the football field and dead ball, or is it a foul to break the other one? 12, we will cover those throughout the, um, throughout the course. So last week, we ended on, um, We ended on a major clock stoppages. So we're on rule three. We're going to finish rule three today, and then we'll hit rule four uh, next, uh, next week, next Tuesday. What's important about the major clock stoppages is that the ball will not, the clock will not start until a legal snap or a free kick touched by R. Now remember. If, a free, if we do a free kick, if K touches the ball, the clock doesn't start, right? If the clock doesn't start when the ball is kicked, the clock starts when R touches the ball in the field of play, right? So if R touches the ball in the, in the goal line, it's a touchback because the, if a ball, if a, if a kick breaks the goal plane, it's dead and it goes to the 20-yard line. So if R touches the ball on the field of play, the clock starts on the kickoff. These 10 major clock stoppages is very important to know because we know is the clock will not start on a ready for play. The clock will start on the snap or free kick, all right? So what we didn't cover are minor clock stoppages. This is where the clock can start on the ready for play, all right? This is where the referee will go, Ooh, and he'll get a clock start whistle and the clock will start. An award or measure for a first down, right? So we know in high school football, if there's a first down, the clock stops. An official time, as an official, it's considered an official timeout. So we can get the chains set in place. Once the ball is spotted, the uh, referee will blow the whistle and start the clock, and the clock will run. On an injured player, obviously, if there's an injured player on the field, we're going to have an official timeout. Once the player leaves the field, we're going to, if the clock was running when we stopped it, we're going to restart the clock and keep going. To dry or change a game ball, you know, if it's wet, blah, 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 we can do an official timeout, change out the game ball, and keep it moving. Uh, heat, humidity timeouts. We live in Florida. It gets hot out there, and sometimes we can, uh, the referee can deem to call it a, a water break. Let, it, let the players get water, and then once the water break is over, if the clock was running when we stopped it, we can restart it. A coach-referee conference, all right? Unusual delay, any unusual delay. Now, guys, if, if the clock is running, and, and you know that it's, it's taking a while to get the ready for play started, it could be a number of reasons. As a, as a referee, we can't call it, we can't stop the clock until we get everything taken care of so the, so the running clock is not running. And then once the delay is over, we can start the clock. Any attempt to conserve time illegally, right? So you got, you got a team that's trying to conserve the time illegally. Remember, as a referee, the referee has grad latitude to start and stop the clock as he deems fit. Sideline warning. So we have to stop the clock, official timeout, give a sideline warning, and then restart the clock. Any official timeout, obviously. A dead ball following a penalty, except the penalty for the layup game foul. Now, obviously, we got a foul. This is where good mechanics comes into place. 
if you're an official, you don't have to be the referee. If you throw a foul, as soon as the play is over, you should be tweeting your whistle, stopping the clock. Whoever the official throws the fly should automatically be stopping the clock after the play, unless it's a dead ball foul. You'll blow the whistle and you'll stop the clock immediately. And the, you'll let the referee know what the foul is. He will he'll, he'll administrate and you'll restart the clock. Um, again, one of my biggest things here is that when I have an official, be it new or veteran, uh, they throw a flag, they just walk in. Like, what? I got a foul. I'm like, you didn't stop the clock, right? You need to stop the clock. Every official, when you throw a flag, if the play is over, a lot of ball foul, you wait till the play is over, you stop the clock. If it's a dead ball foul, you stop the clock immediately if the clock is running. Equipment worn improperly, including helmet coming off or repair within 25 seconds of the official timeout, will start the clock as soon as it's over. A four minute warning when, the, uh, when there's no visible, I spelled that wrong, when there's no visible game clock. If we're keeping now, this is technical. And I know I was, I don't think even I do this. I used to do it. I don't do it much anymore. But if the official clock is on the field and you're keeping the clock on your watch, in the last four minutes of the third and the fourth quarter, you're supposed to stop the game clock and let both teams know that there's four minutes remaining in the game. How many of y'all do that? All right? By rule, if there's no visible game clock, at four minutes, you're supposed to stop the clock and then let everybody know there's four minutes remaining. Like a four minute, like a two-minute warning, where in high school is a four-minute warning when there's no visible game clock. Right? Um, again, if you keep it on watching your field, you're supposed to stop the clock and let everybody know. So the difference between a minor uh, now when we get out of major and minors. Obviously, a major always outrule a minor, right? So you can have a major minor in the same play, right? A player running the ball, he get past the first down, but he runs out of bounds. Running out of bounds is a major clock stoppage. Although he got the first down, you're not going to start the, the clock when the, when the first down is reset because a major clock stoppage happened, which is run out of bounds, so the clock will start on snap. Same as a a four pass, an incomplete four pass stops the clock. There may be a foul with in, associated with the uh, with the major clock stoppage, but we're not going to start the clock into the snap. So what we're going to stand here between majors and minors, a minor clock stoppage is basically saying if we didn't have to do anything administrative wise, the clock would have kept running. So once we stop the clock and do whatever we have to do administrative wise. We want to restart that clock because it, it was running before we stopped and it should be running after we finish. All right. So that's the two major differences between the two. Now, there's a two minute rule, all right, in dealing with the minor clock stoppages. All right. It's, uh, when a penalty is accepted for with less than two minutes uh, remaining in either half, the offended team will have the option to start the game clock on the snap. What this means. So let's say uh, A has the ball, and let's say the score is 7-6, all right? A has the football, um, is let's say less than 25 seconds remaining in the game. A false starts, right? Because of a false start, the clock stops, right? Now, by rule, after we administer um, the foul, we're supposed to restart the clock because the clock was running before the foul. What they change is, okay, now in the last two minutes of either half, the defense or whoever who did who, who the foul didn't commit the foul, can tell the referee we want the clock to start, we want the clock to start on the snap and not on the ready for play. So any so basically again, any foul, any penalty 
in the last two minutes of the third and fourth quarter, the team who the offended team made choose to get the, to have the start the clock start on the snap and not the wind. Okay, charge timeouts, official timeouts, intermissions. Official timeouts. We're, we're, we're official, so we all gonna talk about the officials first and then talk about everybody else last, right? So we can call an official timeout for measurement of a possible first down, right? So if it's close and you feel that you want to give a measurement, you can. Not by rule, a team can ask to have a measurement, but we can deny it if we know it's not as obvious not there. We can deny any team request for a measurement. However, you know, you want to keep the tension down, you can do it, but you don't really have to. Right? When a first down is declared, again, I see this a lot among um, rookies as well as some veteran officials. When there's a first down, we stop the clock. So you see a first down, everybody stops the clock. And then the referee are whining, right? So when I'm when I, this year, when I'm coming out and I'm doing uh, evaluation and things of that nature, I'll be looking for our mechanics. And one of the mechanics I want to see is that everybody is doing an official timeout when there's a first down. Following a change of team possession, again, some do it, some don't. We all stop the clock on a team change possession. When captains and coaches are notified of the time remaining, again, that we talked about in the last four minutes in the game uh, in the third and fourth quarter when there's no visible clock, we call official timeout and notify the team of the time remaining. A player in need of equipment repair, to dry or change the ball, unusual heat and humidity, a coach referee conference, after a foul to administer the penalty. Again, we whoever throws the flag should be stopping the clock either during a dead ball foul or after the left live ball foul becomes dead. For any unusual delay for the ready for play. TV and radio timeouts, one minute intermission between periods following scoring down and are in periods to free kicks. So honestly, every time we, like when we stop the clock and we got the, um, at the end of the period, we switching that, switching uh, goal lines, all those are considered official timeouts. If it's not a charge timeout, it's, it's considered an official timeout, right? So those are, those are there. Let's talk about the big five. The official timeouts of the big five. I call it the big five. They don't, nobody's called the big five. It's something that I, I came up with. A parent injured player, right? So we got an injured player, the part of the big five, we're going to give an official timeout. That's pretty common. We all know that. Any player who exhibits um, a concussion. So I didn't write the whole thing down here, but there's a couple of things, guys. You can go on the uh, nfhsr.org site. They got a concussion course that is free that you can take. It'll tell you everything about concussions, what, how to recognize concussions. I suggest everybody take that course. But any player who exhibits any sign of concussions, we're going to call an official timeout and let the coach know he needs to be removed from the game. Blood discovered on a player or uniform. Again, you no know, communicable diseases. If you see it, if a, if a uniform is saturated with blood, the player has to come out and can't come back in until that's corrected. I mean, you have to put on, you have to put on a new uniform, whatever the case may be. If we got blood, not a scratch, but blood dripping, we're gonna go on official timeout, and he must be removed from the game until that bleeding is covered or stopped. Helmet comes completely off during the down or subsequent dead ball actions related to the down without being directly attributed to a foul by an opponent. Rule 3510D, we're going to, that's the one we're going to cover most when we're talking about the helmet. The, the, the question that we brought up before 
the um and your text message. We're gonna definitely talk about that here in a minute. That's, that's number four. And number five, a player equipment is missing or improperly worn. And I'm gonna tell you something. I have been seeing a lot of that recently with our youth players, especially the higher kids, right? They're watching way too much NFL, way too much college. I don't know what they're watching, but we got players now with the pants laid way up over the knees. I don't see no knee pads. If they have knee pads, it's barely, it's not covering the knees. By rule, the pants must cover the knees. And lately, these kids are out there just, just totally getting away from the, the, the mandatory equipment rules. I'm going to stress it to the coaches this year. And it's, guys, we can't get lights on this among the players, right? Back in the day, it used to be a 15-yard penalty. It's still a 15-yard penalty for illegal equipment. But now they just say, hey, if you, can see, if you see it before the clock start, stop the game clock and get them out the game. If, if it's, you see it during the play, after the play, he must leave the game. So out of these five, out of these big five, the player shall be replaced for at least one down, right? The players cannot buy themselves into the game with a timeout. So, and also the rule says, unless it's the end of the period or, or halftime or, 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 or overtime, uh, halftime or overtime, that's, he can come back after halftime and come back back to overtime. However, uh, he has to go out for one play if we have to call an official timeout for any of these five. Because they all they all time out. You give coach a timeout. Coach, then after the play, you see that player, hey coach, he can't be on the field. I call a timeout. Coach, the timeout don't buy the player back. The player still must be out of the game for one play. All right. Rule three, five, ten, D. All right. I've been hearing this a lot on the football field when I'm officiating games. Your player take his helmet off. Coach just start screaming. Um, they tell me that the player has to come off the field or it's a foul because the player took his helmet off on the field of play. So is it illegal for a player to remove his helmet on the field of play during a dead ball? To ask that question, we have to answer a whole bunch of other questions. One, what does the rule book say about the helmet? That's the first thing we need to find out. One of the first rules, it says, when a helmet comes completely off the runner, in rule 422K, that if the helmet come off the runner, we automatically kill the play. Right? They could be driving, as soon as the helmet comes off, we're blowing the whistle, we're killing the play, we're stopping the play immediately if the helmet comes off the runner. The rule also states, for a player whose helmet comes completely off during a down to continue to participate beyond the immediate action in which the player is engaged. So this is not the runner, it's anybody other than a runner. If his helmet comes off, let's say I'm making a tackle on my helmet come off, I can complete the tackle. But if my helmet comes off and I run and come to participate and continue to participate in the play, either blocking someone or making a tackle or whatever is illegal participation. Rule 964G. The rule in a personal foul is that I cannot take my helmet to throw it to trip an opponent. Somebody did it one day, they made it a rule. Can't take your helmet off to trip an opponent. And the last one, was a personal foul, is to initiate contact with an opposing player whose helmet has come completely off. So in other words, if my helmet comes off, no one can't block me, no one can't touch me uh, from the opposing team, it says, because obviously I'm out of the play because, and, and, and number two, I can't participate. Number four says you can't make contact with that individual either. 
right? And all of this, you will notice, they have to deal with a lot of ball scenarios. It's nothing to deal with their ball scenario. I know some teams make it rules for their players. You cannot, I want to think you're on a football field, keep your helmet off. Maybe in the NFL, it might be a rule that you can't take your helmet off in the NFL. In high school rules, it doesn't mention that you cannot remove your helmet on the field of play during a dead ball. Big thing here, guys, this is rule two. A rule is one of the groups of regulations which governs the game. That's the definition of a rule. It continues to say a rule sometimes states what a player may do. But if there is no such statement for a given act, it is assumed that he may do what is not prohibited. So what I'm saying is there's nowhere in the rule book that prohibits a player from taking his helmet off doing a dead ball. Nowhere in the rule book. So if there's no rule that said he can't take his helmet off doing a dead ball, then why are we making it a rule? What the rule does state, again, it is not a foul to remove your helmet on the field to a dead ball. What the rule does state is that each player shall provide, properly wear mandatory equipment while the ball is live. That was the rule states. So while, the, while the, the play is there in between down, the player takes his helmet off to adjust it or to, to fix it, something like the little cushions on the inside, or to do it, he can take his helmet off. You want to take a helmet off on a timeout? Take it off. Right? But the helmet must be on before the play becomes live. All right? So, my coach rule, but it's definitely not a National Federation high school rule. My NFL rule, but it's definitely not a National Federation high school rule. So, File to remove your helmet during the ball. Here's our question. Is an automatic, what down do we automatically know we're going to call uh, official timeout? Right? And it is, it's, it's, you know, yeah, first down, second down, third down, fourth down. And, and most associations, they, they come up with a hand, so they might do this. Um, some others might be doing something, but we know that on fourth down, we automatically going to stop the clock on four, at, at the end of fourth down. There's only two possible um, scenarios on fourth down. The rule states in rule 359, unless the game clock is already stopped, an official timeout shall be taken as soon as the ball becomes dead following a change of team possession or whenever the covering official declares the dead ball and it appears him to gain the, it appears to him the ball has reached the line to gain. So on the official on fourth down is there two things that happen. Um, either they didn't get it, it's going to be a change of team possession, or they got a first down. So every, every official should know at the end of fourth down, we're all stopping the game. Right? Again, we give, you know, some people might say, it's fourth down, fourth down, we automatically going to, um, we're automatically going to, uh, um, stop the clock. So we, we're all on the same page. Okay. A charge team out occurs when the ball is dead. Obviously, there's no such thing as a live ball timeout unless you're playing basketball. All right. So what are the three team charge timeouts? One, request by player, head coach, or head coach designee can request a timeout. Repair of any player equipment requiring assistance. 
And we may talk about that a little bit more, B, because if you're, if you're looking at the rules layman, uh, as a layman, it contradicts itself on, on, on that rule there. And a coach referee conference. So these are three, um, three division that a uh, coach may call a, a uh, charge timeout. Let's look at each three of them separately. A requested timeout. Each team is, is entitled to three timeouts each half. And we know any unused timeouts don't go to the next half. You don't use all your timeouts in the first half. You don't get, they don't get to go to the second half. And if you got any uh, timeouts remaining in the second half, they don't go into overtime. A single timeout should not exceed one minute. Guys, this is where we get in trouble, right? Because we'll, we'll call a timeout, and then we'll start, we'll all get together and start talking about what we're going to do after the game or look at the girls in the stands. You know, Rodney, he always at the girls in the stands, don't you, Rodney? Don't lie. <laughs> but we got to have somebody. <laughs> we got to have somebody on the time to make sure that in 45 seconds, we 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 blowing the whistle, getting everybody back on that field. Because if not, like I, like I mentioned last week, if every if every team take this timeout, and 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 we just look at the change of quarter, I'm talking about high school, we are looking at an 80 minute game. So anything else is just making it longer. Successive charge timeouts may be granted. So in high school football, I didn't call a timeout. And then I'll be like, hey, it's time to get back into the game. Well, you say, well, I want to use my other timeout. They can do that. They can call, they can use all three timeouts in one dead ball scenario. No timeouts remaining request shall be denied. There's no file for a team to call a timeout when they don't have a timeout. We just ignore them. We deny them, all right? This is very important for us guys as, as officials. We need to keep track of the, of the timeouts. So we always get in trouble. In that right, John? We always get in trouble when a coach asks the, the wing official, hey, how many timeouts I got? And the wing official says, oh, you got one timeout left. But everybody else have, he used all three of his timeouts. Right? But he didn't get a timeout left. He doesn't have a timeout left and becomes a big problem for us. So it's very important that we keep track of the timeouts. And if you're not sure, ask one of your crew members, hey man, how many timeouts have we got left? Because this coach wants to know. There's nothing wrong. Let me, let me verify, coach. I got one. Let me verify with one of my crewmates and I'll let you know. And hey, no, you don't have any. We should be keeping track of what period they call a timeout. And what was the time on the clock when they call that timeout? All right, timeout is on hold until the decision is made for a penalty. Another thing, guys, wing, wing officials, you're the, you're, the, you're the guy that's close to the team. And there's a foul on the play. Coaches asking for a timeout. It can't get that timeout until we get a decision on a foul. So if it's the other team, if, if this team, if A committed the foul, A asking for a timeout, A has to wait to B make a decision on the foul before we grant that timeout, All right? No timeout is given until the decision is made on the penalty. All right, equipment timeout. Now, I just said that a player have a problem with his equipment, he must leave for one down, and a timeout can't buy that player into the game. Well, there is an instance where a timeout can keep a player in the game. There are two way, there's two different um, statements. There's one statement talking about I'm wearing my illegal equipment. But during the action, that, that legal equipment has become illegal somehow. Either my, the bike plate is sticking out, my shoulder pad is sticking out, the little strap on the shoulder pad may come loose, or 
the little the little insert may pop out, whatever the case may be. And it's going that that repair it may delay the ready to play for more than twenty five seconds. If it's a legal equipment issue, the coach may call a timeout to repair it, and the player may remain in the game. Right. If you need if you need assistance, they may call timeout. Team has a charge timeout. Timeouts remaining. All right. So the difference between what we said in Rule Three Five Ten E is that if a player is missing equipment, or a player when um, equipment improperly or, or illegally. That player must go out. So if I'm missing a knee pad, I can't call a timeout, put the knee pad in and remain in the game. I have to leave, right? But if I'm wearing all my equipment and my little strap on my shoulder pad came off, and I'm having a hard time putting it on, the team can use a timeout to keep the player in the game if it requires more assistance to reconnect that. If they have timeouts remaining, if they don't have any timeouts remaining, the player must be replaced for one down, right? So the difference is I can call a timeout to repair an, a, a, a something legal that became illegal, but I can't call a timeout when something's illegal or missing. That makes sense? Everybody give me a thumbs up. Thumbs up. All right. You see this picture? I took this picture at a game this year. If you look at his pants, his knees exposed. I think he wearing mighty junior junior pants or mighty Mike pants. He ain't wearing a varsity pants. And that's what they're doing. They're wearing pants like this in the game, we have to stop it. When a charge timeout won't save a player, helmet comes off during a live ball. Helmet comes completely off, timeout won't save him, he has to leave for one play. Equipment is missing or improperly worn, timeout won't save him, have to leave for one play. Wearing uh, legal equipment in an illegal manner, timeout won't save him, they have to leave for one play or until it's fixed. So it's not just leaving. He can't even come back until it's fixed. If he comes back into the game without fixing, it's going to be a foul. It's going to be unsportsmanlike conduct on the coach, definitely, uh, for letting any player come back into the game um, or, or legal participation on the player. The player shall be replaced for at least one down. Coach referee conference. Reviewing decisions that may have resulted from misapplication or misinterpretation of a rule. One of the, one of the things that the NFL, uh, the National Federation High School casebook, one of the examples they, they put in there is pass interference. So in high school football, if the ball is thrown in the vicinity of an eligible receiver and contact is made from to make a difference uh, on, 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 on a receiver, it's past interference before the ball gets there. Now, on, on the, on the, in the case book, it showed that the ball was thrown, there was contact, and the referee gave the uncatchable sign, like the, the ball wasn't catchable. And that's why, that's why it wasn't pass interference. So in the example, the head coach, I mean, the coach calls a timeout for coach referee conference and says, um, why wasn't it pass interference? Uh, he says, well, the guy said it was uncatchable. Well, in high school football, there's no such thing. Uncatchable or not. If you make contact with an eligible receiver when the ball in their vicinity, it's pass interference. So at that point, the referee has to throw his flag 
and call pass interference and change the, change the no call to a call, right? That's the example in the case book. What, referee, what the coach referee covers is not for is for a coach to complain about your call, your judgment call. I don't like that call. Coach, that's not, that's not a valid uh, coach referee conference. Another one might be a good example. You mark off 10, we should have marked off five. Are you marked off 15? We should have marked off 10. Are you marked off 10? We should have marked off 15. You can call a coach referee conference to get that. Um, May a request by a player or a head coach, anyone who can request a, a coach referee conference, a charge timeout. So, Coach has to call a charge timeout for coach referee conference, right? If at the end of that conference, if we if the referee alters the call, it becomes an official timeout, and the coach gets to keep that timeout. If there's no change in the altering of the call, if, if the coach loses that timeout and it remains a timeout. The coach referee conference, it will be on the field of play in front of the team box. Wing official, do not let the coach come onto the field to hold a coach referee conference in between the hash marks. That is not where it's supposed to be held, right? Referees, if a coach run up to you for a coach referee conference, one of the examples is that you run by them and you go stand by their team box on the field of play. Let them come back to you, right? But we do not do a coach referee conference in the middle of the field. It's done on the, on the field, on the field of play, but in front of the team box. All right, on the decision, notify opposing coach. And you already know what's gonna happen, right? Oh, you gonna let him change your call? Oh, you gonna let him, he, he's dictating the game? <laughs> no coach, but he made a valid point. We messed up, we have to fix it. Just be prepared for that. Notify the opposing coach, change the charge timeout into official timeout. Because if this the decision stands, the charge out, charge out remains to that team. If that team does not have a timeout, it becomes a delay of game. Right? So if you if you call a timeout and you don't have a timeout remaining, we're going to get, we're going to make an official timeout. We're going to hear you out, but if there's no change, it becomes a delay of game on, on that team. All right. So there's only two authorized team conferences, right? Outside the nine hash mark, outside the nine yard mark conference, one or more team uh, members, one or more coaches directly in front of uh, the team box within nine yards of the sideline. Or between nine yard, uh, between the nine uh, yard mark conference, one coach on the field to confer with no more than eleven players at his team huddle between the nine yard marks. So, guys, I know a lot of referees for for preventive officiating will tell the teams, "Hey, time out, go see your coach," because if a coach if more, only one coach is allowed in, in, in between the hash marks for the conference. Also, um, if you only allow one type of conference per timeout, so you can't have both. You can't have a coach talking to some players on the, on the sideline and then one coach talking to players in the middle of the field, right? That's, that's a foul can't do that. Either you're going to have them here or you're going to have it there. But you can't have it both. Right? So the best bet is to say to A players, go see your play coaches over the side to alleviate all of the, um, the problems that may arise on that. All right. An authorized conference may be held on a charge timeout and an official timeout if granted by the referee during a big five officials timeout, what we mentioned about uh, blood, uh, injury timeout, um, the referee can say, no, it's going to be really fast. We're not doing no, uh, no, 
no conference is allowed. Players remain you at. Coaches may may off the field. We're gonna get this game started as soon as off the field. The referee can make that decision, or the referee may say, "Yeah, go ahead and go and have a, a, a conference timeout." Only one type of authorized conference may be used during it. Uh, any charge timeout, any official timeout. Only a nine, only an outside nine yard mark conference may be held for, for a big five official timeout. So remember the big five we talked about? If the, if the referee does grant a uh, timeout, it only can be held outside of arch marks near the team box in between the nine, the, uh, the nine yard mark and the sideline. It, you can't have an in, uh, um, a middle conference at all. All right, play clock, ball ready uh, for play and delay, delay game. The ready for play signifies the ball may be put in play by step or a free kick with 25 seconds or 40 seconds on the play clock. How you doing, Vernon? All right. The ball is ready for play, one, when the ball has been placed on um, four down and the referee marks the ready for play after getting the ready for play signal and it's basically a whistle, hand down, chop, blow the whistle, the ball is ready for play. The second way is starting immediately after the ball has been ruled dead by a game official. After the down, the ball has been placed on the ground by the game official and the game official steps away to, to position. So one requires a ready for play signal and one does not. And that basically ties in with the 25 and 40 second play clock. 25 second play clock, with, um, uh, the 25 second will be on a play clock and start on the ready for play signal prior to a try following score. Uh, to start a period of overtime series, follow administration of an uh, inverted whistle, follow a charge timeout, follow an official's timeout, follow a legal kick when either team is awarded a new series, following the stoppage of, of the play clock by the referee for any other reason. So basically, Anytime there's a stop in play, a foul, or whatever the case may be, there's an exception to the fouls, and we'll talk about that. Um, a, we're going we're to reset to a 25-second play clock. Very simple. Um, the exception to that, and, and it says to eliminate the potential timing advantage gained by the defensive team, the rules committee approved the play clock being set to 40 seconds when official timeout is taken for an injury to a defensive player or a defensive player has an equipment issue. So in other words, let's say the play is over, we, we set the 40 second play clock, but then we notice that, you know, we have, we have to do an official timeout because we got an injured defensive player, right? Once that is taken care of, we reset the 40 second play clock. We do not go to a 25 second play clock. If we have a problem with his equipment and we have to call an official timeout for him to repair his equipment, we don't reset to a 25 second play clock. We reset to a 40 second play clock, All right? Now there's a foul by defense, 25 second play clock, All right? The only time we don't reset to a 25 second play clock is that exception right there. A 40 second play clock will, uh, will be on the play clock after they down other than what is specified in the 25 second play clock when the ball is declared dead by a game official. So any other play, incomplete pass, run out of bounds, as long as there's no administrative stops, there, it'll be a 40 second play clock from the time the ball is dead, not when the ball is spotted, when the play is over, and then when the official comes and set the ball down and step away, uh, the, that, that, that signifies to the offense that the ball is ready for play. All right. 
actions or inactions which prevents promptness in putting the ball in play is a delay of game. This includes failure to snap or free kick prior to the play clock expires. 25 seconds or 40 seconds. Unnecessary carrying the ball after it's become dead. As you know, team score a touchdown, they run the ball, you trying to get the ball from them, they just hijack the ball, going all over the place. You, you can't call it the new game for that. It's, you know, you should judge on that. Um, a coach referee conference, no charge and no timeout. So again, if we ever do a coach referee conference, he has no timeouts remaining. There's no alternate call, delay a game. Snapping or free kicking the ball before they're ready for play. Again, by and blow the ready for play, you can't snap the ball or free kick the ball. It is a delay of game. We rarely call it, but it is a delay of game foul. Any other conduct which unduly prolongs the game. So that's a judgment call. And we'll give out some examples later on or whatever. Fair to unpile from an opponent in a timely manner. So all of these are delayed games. We, we see them all the time. We normally just say, guys, stop it. But understand that you can't call, you have the, the potential to call a delayed game foul. All right, substitutions. Rule two reigns. It just means I'm going to give some definitions out real fast. All right, rule two. A player is one of the 22 members who is designed to start either half of the game or who subsequently replaces another player. A substitute is a team member who may replace a player or fill a player vacancy. A replaced player is one who has been notified by a substitute that he is to leave the game. So, a replaced player is a player who's being replaced, basically. A substitute who comes in, once you tell that player, I'm here, that player becomes a replaced player and must leave the game. All right. Is there a foul to have 12 players in the office of others? Again, just like the helmet, let's find out. Between downs, any number of eligible substitutes may replace players. Replaced players shall begin to leave the field in three seconds. Okay. So in other words, once the substitute come in, let the replaced player know I'm here to replace him. That replaced player has three seconds to start leaving the field. Right? Or the, the dead ball illegal substitution. Now, prevent a fishing uh, stop. Count your players. You should be counting your players. At the end of the down, you should be already counting your players. Now, if you see another player coming into the huddle, the best thing to do is, hey, offense, count your players. We don't say, we don't, you should not be saying, hey, somebody needs to leave. You should not be saying, hey, you got 12. You should just simply say, count your players. The biggest problem that we see having 12 on the field is doing after a timeout or a change of team possession, when a coach says, offense blue, come on the field, and one of the offense red players got confused and came on the field with them, or, or on defense, the same thing. And typically, we need to be alert because that's when we normally see 12 on the field. So, the question is, is it a foul to have 12 in the offensive huddle? I'll tell you right now, there's no rule in the rule book that says it's a foul to have 12 in the huddle or 12 to break the huddle. For example, I'll give you an example. It says three seconds. So, let's say that they're in the huddle. The substitute comes in. As he comes into the huddle and tells the replaced player he has to leave, they break. The replaced player continues off the field. Is that a foul? Well, he left within three seconds. 
There's no other rule that says it's a foul to have 12 in the huddle or break the huddle. Away. Might be in the NFL, but not in high school. All that matters is that the replaced player shall begin, not be off the field, but begin to lead the field within three seconds. Right? Restrictions. To leave the field at the side on which his team is located and go directly to his team box. So in other words, if a, if a, if I, if a substitute comes in to replace somebody, if that player leaves out the end line, it's actually a dead ball foul illegal substitution. Right? If he goes out on the opposing team side, it's a dead ball illegal substitution. Right? He has to leave on his side of the field be, between the, the sideline and get off the field, and he must then go directly to his team box. He can't go off the field and just sit there and watch the play. Right? That becomes a live ball illegal substitution. Plus, leave the field and go straight to his team box. Other restrictions. Become a player, then withdraw or withdraw and re-enter as a substitute. Exception, penalty, dead ball foul, timeout, a period ends. So let's clarify that. Let's say I come, I'm on the field. I think I'm number 12. I'm the 12th player. So I run off the field. I realize there's only 10. I come back on the field. That's fine. But if I come off the field and then somebody goes and replace me on the field, I cannot come back and then replace them on the same dead ball. That's one of those exceptions. A penalty, dead ball foul, timeout, or period in. That's the illegal substitution. If I, I come on as a substitute, I have to stay on the field for one play. In other words, I can't come on to the huddle or come on defense and, and be a player and then leave the field. Uh, no, no, uh, uh, back on the sideline. So that's to prevent somebody coming to the huddle, giving out a play, and then running back to the sideline. You run to the huddle, you stay there. Somebody else has to leave. All right? Number C, be on this team side of the neutral zone when the ball is snapped or free kick. So obviously, if we're down on one side of the field and, and the defense is further away, if the player come on the field, um, either as that 11th person or come to replace somebody, he must be on his side of the neutral zone when the ball is snapped. A replaced player must be off the field of play before the snap, and no substitute shall enter the field during a down or live ball. All right? So that means if a substitute come in, as a player running off the field, if the ball is snapped, is a live ball foul. I'm going to tell you what they taught us in our high school association. And it's a good rule of thumb. If the player is behind his wing official, he's considered off the field. Right? So, if I see a player trying to get off the field and the ball is about to be snapped, if I step up and he's behind me, He's considered off the field. That don't mean the other wing official on the other side throw your flag. Right? He's off the field. Get behind me, I'm a headliner, he's off the field. He might be on the field, but in our, he's off the field. Um, and obviously, if there's only 10 on the field and the player snap, Number 11 can't come on the field and say, oh, we only got 10 out there, ball is snap, I'm coming on the field to participate. That's the legal participation. Or if he doesn't participate, it becomes a non-player file. And we'll talk about how you administer that later. All right. If you have any questions on that, when we, get, when we get done, you can ask all the questions you like. But is it a foul to have 12 players in the office huddle? I'm saying the rule book it is. It's not a foul. All right, that's it. We done it. 
I'm trying to mute you guys real fast. Give me one second. You know my challenge. <laughs> 